Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Gardiron. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Fisher Funds. Look, every Tuesday at Fisher Funds, the investment team, whether it's me or, or one of the team, update our advisor network and our advice team here of what's happening in markets and give them a bit of an overview of some of our portfolio companies and, and things that we're seeing in markets. Now, this week, I ran a session that we thought was particularly relevant and interesting for clients, given how vastly different the investment landscape is this year compared to um, this time last year. So I thought what we'll do is record this and share it on our website for people that are interested. So if you are particularly interested in what's been happening in markets this year and what some of the opportunities are that we're seeing both in the equity and, and bond markets, then this would be a good webinar to listen into. It'll run for about 20 minutes and there are plenty of slides along the way to illustrate. So just to touch on this point about 2022 being a vastly different investing landscape, perhaps if we contrast between um, this time last year and where we are now. So if you went back to this time last year, inflation in New Zealand was about 3%. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand hadn't started hiking interest rates. Share markets were still on an upwards trajectory and valuation multiples were looking pretty full. And we hadn't heard the, the word recession in a long, long time. Now, if you fast forward to today, we're in quite a different world. We've got interest rates, which are much higher, inflation, which is higher, Central banks have been, have been hiking interest rates and we've started to talk about recession again. So we're in this vastly different landscape, both economically, but also because of the journey that we've been on in terms of share prices falling and, and fixed income returns being particularly weak. We're also in a different landscape in terms of the investment opportunity set. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. So firstly, on the current state of play, and I thought I'd illustrate this just by putting up a chart here of the biggest risk in financial markets. Now, Bank of America conduct a survey of professional investors like ourselves every, every month, actually, and ask investors what they say see as the biggest tail risk. And you can see from the chart here, it changes from year to year, but it also changes from month to month as well. And during the course of this year, we've seen it change from being inflation to the war in Ukraine to oil prices. And currently, the biggest tail risk that's being talked about is the risk that central banks will hike rates so much that they cause a recession. And if you've been following financial markets or the financial news in the last month or so, you would have seen increasing talk about this risk of recession and also talk of us being in a, a bear market, which is where share markets, which is when share markets are down by 20% or more. So we are in a bear market and there's increasing talk of recession. Now, when you think about this, it makes sense. We've seen interest rates for example, for mortgages in New Zealand, go from less than 3% for a one-year fixed rate to almost 6% in just 12 months. So you can imagine the increased mortgage burden that that causes, combined with increasing cost of living, whether it's fuel, whether it's groceries, would have the potential to significantly um, clamp down on consumer spending. So the risk of recession is warranted, um, but it's only one scenario, and, it, and New Zealand is only one country. So if you think abroad to the US where most of our KiwiSaver investments sit, you've got a quite different view and quite different view because consumers in the US that have mortgages tend to have long-term fixed mortgage rates. So the US market went through a housing correction about 12 years ago now. And as a result, consumers went out and took out long-term fixed mortgages. And a large percentage of Americans now have 30-year fixed mortgages. So that means that as interest rates rise, there won't be quite the same impact on the consumer now. At the same time, we've also got a pretty low unemployment rate in the US, and it's been unusual to have a recession when unemployment has been so low. But look, there's still a risk of recession. You can make the case for both um, sides. But I guess the key point that I wanted to make on the next slide is simply that share markets are forward looking and they're already starting to anticipate the risk of recession. So the chart here simply shows that the year to date performance of a number of different share markets. In the middle, you've got the S&P 500 index, which is down 21%, the New Zealand market, which is almost down the same amount. And out to the right, you've got some of the other indices, um, the Russell 2000, which is a smaller company index, the NASDAQ, which has a lot of technology companies. They've sold off significantly more than the broader market, indicating that perhaps that people are worried about a recession. And the other side to this, on the left-hand side, you've got the global infrastructure stocks that have really held in there pretty well, which again shows that, that investors are worried about recession and they're selling out of higher growth names and buying into infrastructure and more defensive companies. 
But a key point here is that markets are already down 20%. And as a result of being down 20%, they're already pricing in some probability of a recession. And in fact, if you look at all of the recessions that the US has had in their share market over the last about 70 odd years, um, there were a number of recessions and in the average recession, share markets fell by 24%. So the market is already to an extent pricing in this risk of recession. It's not to say that if we do have a recession, markets won't fall further, and I would expect them to, but you have to remember that's only one potential scenario. There's also a scenario where we avoid recession and inflation perhaps starts to slow as well, in which case you know, markets could be significantly higher. But the key point of the slide is that we have had a, a pretty big sell-off in equity markets this year. Um, the next slide simply shows that we've also had a really significant sell-off in, in fixed income or bond markets. In fact, the sell-off in, in bonds has been really unprecedented. It's the biggest ever sell-off that we've had in, in the prices of um, whether it's government bonds or corporate bonds. And the index here simply shows a chart of the Barclays Global Aggregate Index, which is down over 10% so far this year, which is about twice the sell-off we had back in, in 1994. So if you're a fixed income investor, it has been a, a really challenging period as well. Now, as a result of the falling bond markets and falling equity markets, we can see that sentiment is, is pretty negative and, and fear is pretty high at the moment. The chart here simply shows a what's called the fear gauge, which is, a, um, is basically a survey that's done by the American Association of Individual Investors. And it shows that currently a net 30% of investors are, feel, are feeling bearish or feeling worried about markets. And that's more bearish than investors were back in the COVID sell-off and during the, the global financial crisis. Now, there are different ways of measuring um, sentiment of investors. There are other ones out there at the moment that show that it's not quite as extreme as what this chart shows, but, but regardless of the measure that you look at, things are pretty bleak at the moment. Now, the first few slides that I've shown really do show a pretty, pretty so a sobering story in, in financial markets. But the reality is everything that I've shown you so far as well is, is about what's happened in the past and what investors really need to care about and think about a lot is what might happen in the future. So I thought I'd, I'd talk a bit about that. Um, we've, we've obviously been on this really bumpy journey in the last six months, but sometimes after you've been on a bumpy journey, the, the destination that you end up is actually not too bad. And again, I wanted to go back to where I started here by contrast contrasting just one year ago to where we are today. And in 2021, if you looked at our income funds, this Fisher Funds Income Fund, it had a running yield of about 2.5% because interest rate rates were extremely low. Fast forward to today with rising interest rates over the last year, that income fund has got a yield of about 6.5%. So we've moved from this world a year ago where interest rates were low and you couldn't get a return investing in bonds that was likely to outstrip inflation. Fast forward to today, and over the next five years, we'd expect the income fund here to outstrip inflation by, by a meaningful amount. On top of that, you've had equity valuations come back quite significantly. So the MSCI World Index has seen price to earnings ratio fall from about 19.3% to 14.3%. So it's gone from being, equity markets globally have gone from being expensive compared to the long-term averages to being cheap compared to the long-term averages. So in just one year, we've had this pretty significant change in return expectations for both bonds and equities. And I'll try and illustrate this with a couple of examples in the bond and equity world. Um, but first, I think it was pretty interesting, about a week ago, we saw an interview with famous investor Howard Marks, who invests in, in credit in the US. He's been around for a long time, and he's a pretty, um, a pretty dry character, doesn't get too emotional. And what he said in this interview is that today I'm starting to behave aggressively. Everything we deal in is significantly cheaper than it was six to 12 months ago. And he also said that he thinks the idea of waiting for a bottom or for markets to fall further is a terrible idea. So Howard Marks is, is finding lots of opportunities in the areas he operates in and he's starting to buy. And we're also seeing a lot of opportunities. So first starting with, with fixed income or bond markets, We've gone from, and this is a chart showing corporate investment grade bond yields in the US, so that you know the return that you get on, expected to get on a bond. And interest rates here have gone from decade lows to decade highs in just 18 months. 
So the prospects there of getting a, a good return that outstrips inflation are significantly higher than they were just a year or 18 months ago. Now that's, that's what the index offers, but we obviously are out there looking for specific investment opportunities where we think we can do significantly better than the market. And just to illustrate, I thought I'd bring up a case study of one particular bond investment that we have in our, in our income funds. And this is a European company called Griffoles, which is a, a leading player in the global plasma industry. Now, this is a pretty consolidated industry. Our Australian share market fund invests in CSL, which is the leading player in the industry. And our international equity fund historically has looked at investing in Griffoles. And the reason is it's a pretty consolidated industry with, with high barriers to entry, and it sells a product that's needed regardless of the state of the economic cycle. Now, if you went back to October last year, the bonds in Griffoles were yielding a re return of about 3.7%. But with interest rates going up and credit spreads widening, you can now get 7.1% in, in euros. But if you hedge that back to New Zealand dollars, your expected yield on that is about 10.5%. So this shows just how drastically the return prospects of various bonds have changed in a pretty short period of time. And as a result, in our income funds, we've been starting to rotate out of global government credit into corporate credit like Griffoles. And we think there are some pretty... Uh, great prospects out there for good returns and fixed income in, in the years ahead as a result of yields rising so much over the last year. Now, the chart here is a chart which shows the S&P 500 um, during and after bear markets effectively. So this shows basically all the bear markets that we've had since 1948. So a bear market is essentially defined as when a share market falls by 20% or more. Now, the interesting thing about this chart, the thing that stands out the most to me is that we do have bear markets regularly and they do fall between 20 and 50%. But the reality is the, the bull market that follows these bear markets tends to be significantly larger and lasts for a lot longer than the bear market. And we saw this after the global financial crisis. So during the global financial crisis, which was a really brutal one for share markets, um, and they fell 52%. But in the 11 years after that, markets went on to gain 400%, which shows the, the risk of trying to sell out when, when equity markets are falling. The risk is that you miss out on the, the subsequent rebound. Another really interesting one, I think, for investors at the moment is to look at the bars around 1980. And you can see in 1980, there was a 27% fall in equity markets. Now, the interesting thing about this is this was when Paul Volcker came in as the Federal Reserve Chairman, and he came in at a particularly difficult time when inflation was high in the US, and his job essentially was to, to squash inflation, and he did that by hiking interest rates extremely rapidly to, to really high levels, which did cause a bear market, a short bear market, but ultimately when people became comfortable that inflation was under control, over the next five years, she markets rallied by over 200%. So this, I think, is just a good chart to put bear markets, which we're in right now, and, and never feel particularly comfortable, but it, it really helps put them in context. Another chart here simply shows that share markets tend to follow earnings growth over the long term. So the S&P 500, the US share market index, has climbed gradually over the long term, following the earnings prospects of the company in that index. Yes, there are short-term fluctuations and that benchmark can move around pretty significantly over short periods, but over long-term, equities follow earnings. And that provides a really good backdrop to talk about um, one specific example, but there are lots of other examples we could talk about just to show how we get confidence bottom-up in the potential returns of our portfolios by looking at the individual companies in those portfolios. So here's a great case study of a company called um, PayPal, which is a leading online wallet for, for making purchases. And this is a company we've held for, for a number of years. In fact, we've held it since its IPO. And it's come under a lot of pressure over the last year as the broader technology sector has been sold off. Now, this is a business that's got over 400 million users globally, and it's got an extremely um, strong value proposition, both for retailers accepting payments because people are, are less likely to abandon their checkout if, if PayPal is a payment option, but also it's a great value proposition for consumers because they have the safety and security of paying with PayPal. They don't have to enter their um, delivery and payment details every time they check out. Um, and they also know it can be done pretty frictionlessly with, with one touch. So it's a great, um, it's a great 
online payment option. It's been growing extremely rapidly, but it sold off significantly with the broader market. Now, you can make some pretty conservative assumptions, in my view, around how this business will grow over the long term. Historically, it's grown in line with what ahead of e-commerce growth. But even if we assume that it grows slower than e-commerce growth out to 2029, it doesn't get any margin expansion and it ultimately trades on one of the lowest earnings multiples it's ever traded on in 2029, we would expect that the share price could be you know, approximately two times its current level in seven years time. Now, if you paint what I believe is a, is a more realistic case and you do, they do continue to grow in line with global e-commerce growth, they get a little bit of margin expansion because ultimately payment networks are businesses that do have good operating leverage. And if they exit on a multiple broadly in line with the market, then we think that the stock price could go up almost fourfold over the next seven years. So this is just an example of, of sort of highlighting how earnings growth and the underlying fundamental growth in a business is what will drive share price returns over the medium term. It'll be less driven by the multiple. And then after you have a big sell-off like the sell-off we've just seen, the opportunity set looks significantly better. There are lots of other opportunities we could we could highlight, but I just wanted to highlight one today. But it's just an example of an opportunity that we think is a good one and underpins some of the returns that we expect from our broader portfolios. So perhaps just a, a few final thoughts on all of that. So there is a lot of uncertainty out there. The macroeconomic backdrop is uncertain. Look, interest rates will probably rise further. Inflation will take a while to die down. And there is a risk that we, that we fall into recession. But the point is that a lot of economic pessimism is already factored into prices, whether that's bond prices, credit or equity prices. And we're actually in a position now with bond prices having fallen, that fixed income is finally offering attractive returns after about 15 years of not being able to say that. So most of the period post the global financial crisis, interest rates have been low, credit speeds have been narrow, and fixed income prospects have looked pretty poor. Um, that has changed a lot in just 12 months. So overall, we know that balance the conservative investors have had a pretty difficult period over the last six months or so. But the result of falling prices is that the prospects going forward are a lot better than they were. And perhaps just finally, look, we appreciate that it is difficult right now. Portfolio balances are moving around a lot and it can be difficult to sort of stick in there and, and be patient. But we ultimately believe because of the, the path we've been on and because of the returns that we can see out there in equity markets and some of the great opportunities we're finding, we ultimately believe that those that do stay the course will be rewarded um, very well for doing so. Look, so thanks a lot for, um, for joining us today. So if there are any questions after you have watched this and anything that you want to follow up on in terms of the opportunity set that, that we're seeing or the risks that we're seeing at the moment, then please feel free to get in touch with us or, or one of our advisors. Um, thanks a lot for your time and have a great day.